The sermon this morning comes from 1 Kings chapter 18. Here now is the word of God. <clears throat> now it happened after many days that the word of the Lord came to Elijah in the third year, saying, Go, show yourself to Ahab, and I will send rain on the face of the earth. So Elijah went to show himself to Ahab. Now the famine was severe in Samaria. Ahab called Obadiah, who was over the household. Now Obadiah feared the Lord greatly, for when Jezebel destroyed the prophets of the Lord, Obadiah took a hundred prophets and hid them by fifties in a cave and provided them with bread and water. Then Ahab said to Obadiah, Go through the land to all the springs of water and to all the valleys. Perhaps we'll find grass and keep the horses and mules alive and not have to kill some of the cattle. So they divided the land between them to survey it. Ahab went one way by himself, and Obadiah went another way by himself. Now, as Obadiah was on the way, behold, Elijah met him, and he recognized him and fell on his face and said, Is this you, Elijah, my master? He said to him, It is I. Go, say to your master, Behold, Elijah is here. He said to him, He said, what sin have I committed that you are giving your servant into the hand of Ahab to put me to death? As the Lord your God lives, there is no nation or kingdom where my master has not sent to search for you. And when they said, he is not here, he made the kingdom or nation swear that they could not find you. And now you're saying, go, say to your master, behold, Elijah is here. It will come about... When I leave you, that the Spirit of the Lord will carry you where I do not know. So when I come tell Ahab, and he cannot find you, he will kill me. Although I, have, your servant, have feared the Lord from my youth. Has it not been told to my master what I did when Jezebel killed the prophets of the Lord, that I hid a hundred prophets of the Lord by fifties in a cave, and provided them with bread and water? And now you're saying, go, say to your master, behold, Elijah is here. He will then kill me. Elijah said, As the Lord of hosts lives, before whom I stand, I will surely show myself to him today. So Obadiah went to meet Ahab and told him, and Ahab went to meet Elijah. When Ahab saw Elijah, Ahab said to him, Is this you, you troubler of Israel? He said, I have not troubled Israel, but you and your father's house have, because you have forsaken the commandments of the Lord, and you have followed the Baals. Now then, Send and gather to me all Israel at Mount Carmel, together with 450 prophets of Baal and 400 prophets of the Asherah, who eat at Jezebel's table. This is the word of God. Thank you for coming out, and I uh, want to encourage you. To come back tonight at 6.30 for the service this evening. Pastor Joe will be preaching out of John chapter 5. We thank God for that privilege uh, to hear the word uh, preached. Also, Pastor Phil will be doing Sunday school today. He and Lizzie are now uh, encouraging uh, Chaplain Ross at First Presbyterian Church Hinckley. Chaplain Ross is preaching this morning in Pastor Kevin's absence. So we want to pray for, uh, uh, for Chaplain Ross. We uh, are very thankful for the Word of God, which guides us even in strange moments like these. And we can take heart and be encouraged. Our passage today is a delightful one. The Old Testament narrative is just that, delightful. It is used by the person of the Holy Spirit to encourage the people of God in all eras. Listen to this quote by Francis Schaeffer. This is one of my favorite books, How Should We Then Live? Francis Schaeffer um, <clears throat> would be considered a um, uh, preacher, teacher, one with a, a keen understanding of the times. Uh, I remember reading this book before becoming a Christian. It drove me to the Word of God, which drove me to Christ. This is um, a work that uh, has also touched many, many other Christians, no doubt. This is what he wrote. Rome was cruel, Schaefer says. 
and his cruelty can perhaps be best pictured by the events which took place in the arena in Rome itself. People seated about above the arena floor watch gladiator contests and Christians thrown to the beasts. Let us not forget why the Christians were killed. They were not killed because they worshiped Jesus. Nobody cared who worshiped whom so long as the worshiper did not disrupt the unity of the state centered in the formal worship of Caesar. The reason the Christians were killed is because they were rebels. This was especially so after their growing rejection by the Jewish synagogues lost for them the immunity granted to the Jews since Julius Caesar's time. They would be rebellious because of two reasons. They worship Jesus as God and they worship the infinite personal God only. And it was that word only that got them into trouble. Hence, they were viewed as rebels. Now, in this context, we must understand that our culture, which is Greco-Roman in nature as well, sees you, it sees me, it sees all Christians as rebels because we believe in the Word of God, we believe that there is only one God, we believe in Jesus Christ who is the King of glory, and we want the whole world to know Him. We do not obey unrighteousness. That's why we are viewed in the modern era as rebels. Think about it. I have read articles and heard uh, conversations on radio indicating that Christians are responsible for all of the troubles uh, against uh, various and sundry minority groups we are responsible for violence. We're the, we're the problem. We, because of our narrow-mindedness, bring havoc. Uh, we're the ones who restrict other religions. So we are viewed by many in this culture as the enemy. But take heart. Because this delightful piece of Old Testament narrative can help us live well in a time when the Greco-Roman world hates us. How should we then live as followers of Christ in 2016 and following? How should we then live when the culture around us sees us as rebels, as troublers? This text here helps us what we're gonna do is we're going to look at the three main characters. There are four actually, but we're gonna look at three uh, characters here and we're gonna determine, okay, who is this troubler of Israel anyway? Who's the real troubler here? And then we're going to apply this discovery to our age. So, Let's pray. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, help us to live well in a world that is troubled by the gospel, is troubled by the name of Jesus, is troubled by truth, indeed, and in many parts of the world, and increasingly in this one, we are viewed as an enemy. Help us to live above this and beyond this, by the power of the Holy Spirit. May our lives be filled with joy. Take the lessons from this text and impress them upon us and may our smile increase, increase to the glory of Jesus. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen. And once again, Old Testament narrative is extremely helpful for the church and particularly in times like these, we don't look at the Old Testament as a place where we go if we want good illustrations. 
or just fun stories. No, this is actually, this is the word of God. We go here so we can learn, so we can live. Think about recent history, people being murdered in Nice, France, and police murdered here in the United States, and strange accounts of persecutions worldwide. Believers face difficult times. People around us are having trouble. We're assaulted. There is one statistic that I discovered in reading this week <clears throat> that struck me. David Barrett in the annual statistical table on global missions in 1996 indicated this stat. Now, there are other statistics out there. This is a higher one. He writes, the annual statistical table estimates that there have been as many as 200,000 Christian martyrs every year since 1970. 200,000 Christian martyrs every year since 1970. That's what I call a problem. <laughs> and yet we hear very little about that. Why? In the main, because we are troublers to many. Now in difficult time, the ungodly culture often looks at Christians as the problem, as we've said, but this doesn't make any sense. If we look at it carefully, it doesn't make sense. So we're the problem, but let it be as such, and we will proceed in the name of Jesus and learn from his text how to live. So we're going to address, uh, address the matter of living well in an ungodly world through asking this question of this text. And this is one way to approach narrative. Know that there are characters in the narrative who have something to say, and God has a divine comment, at least one in every section of the text, that he wants us to know. And so we're going to hone in on this kind of question. Who is to blame, truly to blame, for the trouble in Israel. There were great troubles due to judgment. Uh, there was much trouble in the land. And you can go back to chapter 17, verse 1. Now Elijah the Tishbite of Tishbe in Gilead said to Ahab, As the Lord of, Is of Israel is before whom I stand, there shall be neither dew nor rain these years except by my word. And the word of the Lord came to him. Depart from there and turn eastward and hide thyself by the, book, by the brook of Sherith, which is east of the Jordan. Now, <clears throat> here you see the providence of God. And here you see the lack of rain brought by the judgment of God. Why? Because of paganism. People like Ahab and Jezebel bringing in ungodliness to the nation of Israel. So today we're going to identify the authentic troubler, and we will apply what we learn to this, this uh, our lives in this modern era. Who's the real troubler? The, the text sets this up for us. We might be able to gather uh, information straight away, but look who is the real troubler, and how does that apply in the modern era? Who was this troubler? Turn, if you will, to 1 Kings 18. Obadiah is the first one on the agenda. There are many scholars who look at him and say, uh, this guy was just a big compromiser. Talk about a troubler. Well, let's read. After many days, the word of the Lord came to Elijah in the third year, saying, Go your, show yourself to Ahab, and I will send rain upon the earth. So Elijah went to show himself to Ahab. Now the famine was severe in Samaria, and Ahab called Obadiah, who was over the household. And he was a, he was a civil servant and a, a very trusted one. Now Obadiah feared the Lord greatly. There's the statement that refutes all those who say that Obadiah was a wretch, or all wretches, but that he was somebody who compromised over and over again, and that just simply isn't true. He was a man who greatly feared God. Then it says, 
Obadiah and when Jezebel cut off the prophets of the Lord. In other words, when the believers fall into disfavor, the ungodly go after them. And Jezebel, who was a pagan, went after the prophets. She went right after the seminary. She went to the people who would preach and teach and nailed them, killing them. She didn't hold anything back. She wanted to take him out. And what did Obadiah do? Did he cringe in the corner? If you want me, say, what did Obadiah say? If you're looking for me, I'll be shaking in the corner. No. He, what did he do? I love this in Obadiah. Obadiah took a hundred prophets and hid them by the fifties in a cave and fed them with bread and water. In other words, he engaged in covert activity. He went and got these prophets. Oh no, you're not going to kill them all. And hit them and fed them. And Ahab said to Obadiah, Go through all the land to all the springs of water and to all the valleys. Perhaps we may find grass and save the horses and mules alive and not lose some of the animals. There it is. The state caring for its people. No, this is the state caring for its power. I want to keep my military around me. I want to make this as strong as possible so that um, I can keep my power. So Ahab is a man of power, doesn't care about the people. So they divided the land between them and passed, passed through it. Ahab went one direction by himself and Obadiah went in another direction by himself. Although Ahab was wicked, Obadiah was a loyal servant. He feared God. He refused to compromise. He hid the prophets. This is a very delicate balance. If Ahab, Ahab had have ordered him to, to do something that would be directly opposed to the word of God, Obadiah would have said no. He was willing to risk his own life. Further on in verses 7 through 16, you see how when Elijah said, okay, as Obadiah was on his way, verse 7, behold, Elijah met him, and Obadiah recognized him and fell on his face and said, It is you, my Lord Elijah. What respect Obadiah had. And he answered him, It is I. Go tell your Lord, behold, Elijah is here. And the text picks up as read by Pastor Joe. Obadiah essentially says, Are you kidding? Here's where the fear comes out. Are you kidding me? I know what's going to happen. I'm going to tell Ahab, and then the Holy Spirit is going to take you away to some other place. Ahab's going to say, oh yeah, and then he's going to kill me. Well, who wouldn't be afraid in this kind of a context? Facing down a guy like Ahab with this nasty wife, Jezebel? What a duo. And he's in the court. He loves God. Of course, there's going to be some fear, but Elijah, very much like Elijah, sends him on his way. Don't worry about it. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to deal with Ahab. You just go and do what you're told to do. And this is a test, and he ultimately follows through. So Obadiah is a man of God with fears like all of us. And ultimately, he obeys and does the will of of God spoken through Elijah. Pastor Joe brought something up this week that is very important, and that is you couldn't have Elijah where Obadiah was, and you couldn't have Obadiah where Elijah was. God is the God of providence. He puts people where he wants them. Can you imagine Elijah working for Ahab? That would not be a good working situation. Good morning, troubler. Good morning, troubler. How's life with you? It would be war. But God put Obadiah exactly where he wanted him so that Obadiah would be used by God, gifts and all, to bring the Lord honor and to benefit the people of God. Look at the providence of God. He put Obadiah there to save 100 prophets from the evil chewing machine of Ahab and Jezebel. So Obadiah is not the troubler of Israel. No, sir. He's not the rebel. He's not the one in open rebellion against God 
Who else might be on the agenda? How about Elijah? After all, Ahab called him a troubler. And in a sense, from Ahab's point of view and the culture around Ahab, those who supported him, yes, Elijah was a troubler. Elijah was not someone to be uh, handled lightly. He was someone who stood his ground. Again, note what Elijah does to Obadiah in verse 8. Go tell your Lord, behold, Elijah is here. He wants Obadiah to make this public statement so that God might be honored. And Obadiah wrestles with it. And then Elijah says in verse 14, and now you say, go tell your Lord, behold, Elijah is here and he'll kill me. And Elijah said, as the Lord of hosts lives, before whom I stand, I will surely show myself to him today. So I, Obadiah went to meet Ahab and told him, and Ahab went to meet Elijah. Elijah is a man of God. And he helps Obadiah fulfill the word. And then in verse 17, when Ahab saw Elijah, Ahab said to him, It is you, you troubler of Israel. Is that you? Of course, it's Elijah. So is Ahab right? Is the culture right when it points at Christians and, oh yes, Christians can say and do dumb things? But that's, that's not the majority issue. The majority issue is this. Christians will receive the blast from the culture and more often than not, it makes no sense. Christians are viewed as the enemy very often for no reason at all other than that we're in the way of the agenda of the culture. And Elijah is called troubler by Ahab. He accuses Elijah of treason. Why? Because Elijah speaks for God and Elijah brought the message of the trouble to Israel. Famine. This is no rain. No rain. So, Jezebel went after the prophets because she and Ahab hated the truth. And Ahab sent out to the nations to find the public enemy, number one, Elijah. Do you have him? No. Swear an oath that you don't. He wanted this guy. Verse 10 tells us how much Ahab wanted Elijah. As the Lord your God lives, there is no nation or kingdom where my Lord has not sent to seek you. And when they would say he's not here, he would take an oath of the kingdom or nation that they had not found you. How serious was Ahab about Elijah being the enemy of the state? And he went after him. Elijah is just speaking the word of God. He is not the troubler. I think too often we hear this from the culture. You're the problem. You're the problem. You're the problem. So we stop speaking. So we mold ourselves to the culture. Oh yes, we're to blame, all right. I'm not saying we don't say some people who claim to be Christians are... Oh, they're doing everything right. Of course, they say ridiculous things. I can think of many examples. But overall, Christians worldwide are not the trouble. Not at all. Elijah spoke the word of God, and he's not the troubler. Obadiah is not the troubler. Some scholars say Obadiah was a problem. Some even say Elijah was just too bold. He should have tempered his message. Well, maybe he should have been more seeker-oriented. Elijah was just bold, was telling the truth. That's it. Ahab called him a troubler because he's in the way of the system. You're just a problem with our government policy. So, stop it. Well, as you know, the real troubler is Ahab. The real troubler is the ungodly culture. Look at Ahab in verse 18. Ahab has, already in the text, 
demonstrated a desire to maintain his power. He wants his horses. <laughs> he wants horses and mules alive. He wants his power to be in his hand and there's no there's no passion here for his people. Oh, the poor people, let's help them. Oh no, what about my horses and mules? And we see faithful Obadiah helping out. Ahab goes to him. He's a faithful servant. He's helping out. He does what is right. And Elijah confronts Ahab for many, many reasons. But the main one is contained in verse 18. I have not troubled Israel, but you have and your father's host because you have abandoned the commandments of the Lord and followed the Baals. That's it. That's why he is the troubler. He rightly identifies Ahab as the troubler of Israel. Ahab has abandoned the word of God and has put his trust in Baal. And by the way, Baal is the god of rain. Isn't that ironic? <laughs> I'm putting my trust in Baal. Who's the God of rain? Well, it's not raining. God is the God of the universe. He's the one who is responsible for the weather. By the way, there's some folks now in the climate change group who are really concerned <laughs> because now it's not global warming anymore. It's global cooling. Wouldn't that be a cycle? Hot, cold, hot, cold. Oh well. God is the one who is in control of the climate, not Baal. Jezebel brought in strange gods and then sought to kill the prophets. Chapter 16, verses 31 through 33 tells us of the influx of such darkness. So here's the trouble. Here's the one who troubles. Ahab is the troubler. Anyone who denies the word of God, anyone who denies the word of God like Ahab and Jezebel will hate the truth. And they will invite judgment in accordance with the will of God. Such a person hates the gospel. And that person is the real trouble maker. It isn't the believer who puts his or her trust in Christ and who wants others to know Jesus. That person is not the troubler. Ahab and people like him, they represent troublers. They trouble nations. When leaders declare against God, when they go against the word of God, they are the troublers, not the church. The authentic church, I should say. Now in the New Testament, the world saw Jesus as a troublemaker. Look at Luke 23. Look at Luke 23. We're tending toward our application now. We've identified who is the real troubler of Israel. The state. <laughs> it was Ahab. And Jezebel, the godless state, it's the culture of wickedness. It is the world system. That's the troubler. No one else. It wasn't Obadiah. He's just a faithful civil servant who loved God. Not as, not as bold or courageous at this point as Elijah. Elijah, as we'll see soon, also has his day of trembling. But Obadiah, overall, a man of God, struggled with fear, helped by Elijah. He's not the troubler. Elijah, blamed by the state, called a troubler. No way. He just brought the word of God. And in Luke chapter 23, look at this. <clears throat> Here we see the picture of Christ. Verses 1 through 5. When the whole company of them arose, and this is Jesus just after coming before the council and brought him before Pilate. 
And they began to accuse him, saying, We found this man misleading our nation and forbidding us to give to tribute to Caesar. There's Caesar for you. And saying that he himself is Christ a king. And Pilate asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? And he answered him, You have said so. <laughs> very simple. You've said so. Very strong, very determined. Then Pilate said to the chief priests in the crowds, I find no guilt in this man. But they were urgent, saying, He stirs up the people teaching throughout all Judea, from Galilee even to this place. Ah, he's a troublemaker. That's what Jesus is. And Jesus saw himself as the object of hatred. The culture see, saw Jesus as a troublemaker. Pilate didn't see it, but the enculturated Jews did. They saw him, the religious leaders, the godless religious leaders, they saw him as a troubler. And Jesus saw himself as one hated. Look, if you will, at John chapter 15. Note, John 15. Great passage. Jesus says in verse 18, if the world hates you, know that it hated me before it hated you. Notice the language Jesus uses. He didn't say, <laughs> if the world doesn't like you a little. No, he said, if the world hates you, world system that is, the place where wickedness is exalted, know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you are of the world, in other words, a compromiser, the world would love you as its own, but because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Now, <clears throat> any denomination that decides and suddenly discovers that sin, that a certain sin, is okay today, that is ungodliness. And it's not to be tolerated. When, when certain denominations go after darkness, and you as a believer, and, and, uh, and myself, as we say, no, we can't go there, guess what the culture is going to say? That church now believes in, in things that were once viewed as wicked, but you people are just sticks in the mud. And you deserve to be, you deserve to be treated with the full force of the law. You people, imagine denying individuals their own bathroom. How dreadful, how dreadful. You people who deny other folks to marry, even though they're same sex, you are the problem in this culture. You breed the violence. Jesus saw himself as one who was hated and he warned the disciples, you're gonna be hated too. Acts chapter 24, verse five, note. Acts 24. Here is a passage. This is Paul brought before Felix at Caesarea. Verse 5. We'll start at verse 1. And after five days, a high priest, Ananias, remember him, came down with some elders and a spokesman, one Tertullus. And they laid before the governor their case against Paul. And when he had been summoned, Tertullus began to accuse him, saying, Since... Through you we enjoy much peace, and since by your foresight, most excellent Felix, I guess Felix had very clean sandals that day, reforms are being made for this nation in every way and everywhere. We accept this with all gratitude. But to detain you no further, I beg you in your kindness to hear us briefly, for we have found this man a plague. There you are. If you... If you, are <clears throat> if you are a believer with passion, very often you'll be viewed as a plague. Maybe we should have that as an award in the new Awana. You won your plague button. And we are, to the world, we're a plague. One who stirs up riots among all the Jews throughout the world and is a ringleader of the sect of the Nazarenes. He even tried to profane the temple, but we seized him. By examining him yourself, you'll be able to find out from him about everything of which we accuse him. Why? Because Paul would tell the truth. 
What's the issue? He tells the truth about Jesus. That's why he is public enemy number one. So who is the real troubler? It's Ahab. And he sees Elijah. And he would have seen Obadiah as such. And maybe he did after that incident. But the real trouble, troubler was Ahab himself. And this world, this world is filled with troublers. And they see Jesus as the problem. They see the people of God as the problem. When we're not, when we serve Christ and love Jesus, we aren't. Here are some things to consider in this. Ahab is the real troubler. He represents the state. Along with Jezebel, in the modern era, the same kind of attitude. Hmm, I wonder if there's a couple around in the modern era that reminds me of Ahab and Jezebel. Can't think of one. Anyway, we have these people today who hate the Lord, for whom we pray, God, save them. May they come to the peace of Christ. But these are the people who increasingly turn attention to the church and say, you're the troubler, you're the troubler. When in fact the accuser is, for there is no peace without Christ, there is no rest without God. Now I have three simple applications and then we're going to close. God calls his people by the power of the Holy Spirit, resting in the power of the Spirit, I believe, upon this text. Three simple applications for us to consider. We are to be soldiers, we are to be students, and we are to be witnesses. Soldiers, students, and witnesses. That's what we're to be by God's grace. First of all, soldiers, determined by prayer to keep ourselves from the pollution of the world. James chapter 1. If you'll turn to James chapter 1, verse 27, the Bible says this. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this. To visit orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained from the world. To keep oneself unstained from the world. 1 John 2, 15 through 17 repeats this message. Here you have it. Determined by prayer to keep ourselves from the pollution of the world. James 1.27 is a good verse to memorize. 1 John 2.15-17 as well. And to do so knowing that when we're brought into situations, whether at work or at study or both, we are going to be tempted to sin. But hold to this grand truth. As we determine to kill sin and to fight prayerfully for the truth. To delight in the things of Christ. As we determine to keep ourselves from the pollution of the world. Remember this verse. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Note, this is a passage that has helped me greatly and I know it will help you. 1 Corinthians Chapter 10 and verse 13. No temptation. You know it in the King James. This is the ESV. Has overtaken you. That is not common to man. God is faithful and he will not let you be tempted beyond your own ability. But with the temptation he will also provide the way of escape, escape so that you will be able to endure it. That's good news. So we are called then as people who will be viewed as troublers, although we are not. Those who hate Christ are the real troublers, and so we pray for them. But knowing that we are in a world that has fallen, that is full of hatred for Christ, and increasingly in days like these. Therefore, let us be soldiers and battle sin keeping ourselves by the power of the Holy Spirit from the pollution of the world, keeping in our hearts and minds, James 1, 27, 1 Corinthians 10, 13, memorize, 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 think, apply. Obadiah, Obadiah feared the Lord. 
Obadiah served his master. His master trusted him. And he went out. And he served God. He understood Romans 13, 1, in advance of the writing of it. Colossians 3, 22 through 24, serving his master as unto God, and in the New Testament as unto Christ. And we know that he was no compromiser because he saved alive 100 prophets. We know that he was fearful because it's a very hard place to be. But he ultimately obeyed God through the encouragement of Elijah. There's a man who was determined by prayer to keep himself from pollution of the world. Elijah, the same thing. So we ask God, help us to hate the pollution of the world and to love Jesus. Help us, Lord, to live this way. Secondly, students, read and meditate on the Word of God. Elijah and Obadiah were men of the Word, and they called out Ahab, who had abandoned the commandments, who had left them behind. Be people of the Word by the power of the Holy Spirit. We are to pray. We are to word. We are to seek God. Matthew chapter 7, 24. Note this. Matthew chapter 7, verse 24. I enjoy this passage. Read it often because I need it. Matthew 7, 24. Everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. Remember Psalm chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. Everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rock is Christ. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house, but it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat against that house and it fell and great was the fall of it. Notice, you can expect the beating, but expect this, a life rooted in Christ stands Matthew 7, 24 through 27. Here then, as a student, we read and meditate on the Word of God, and we apply what we read through the power of God. We are not given to merely thinking about the text and walking away. We look at ourselves in the mirror, then walk away and forget what we saw. We look into the Word, and as Elijah and Obadiah did, we become people of God. Elijah getting in the face of Ahab and saying, no, no, no. The word of God must stand. Take a look at the text also. Here's one thought. Elijah was fed by the miraculous power of God through the ravens. One hundred prophets were saved simply by God moving in the heart of Obadiah, who took them in fifties and hid them in caves and fed them with bread and water. You see... God uses, on occasion, miraculous means, but more often than that, he uses the ordinary means of grace. Many churches in our land are saying, we want to expect a miracle. We want to expect a miracle every single day, every single moment. Get a life. Expect God to be God and in the ordinary means of grace. To disregard that is to disregard God. When he moves in a miraculous way, that is wonderful. But every day he moves in the ordinary means and he gets the job done. I don't expect every day, I, oh, expect a miracle. Send in your money, I'll send you a prayer cloth and you can stick it on your head. Nonsense. Expect God to be God. Whatever way he wants to move, miraculous, the ordinary means, it's grace. Think about what happened to Gordon. Sitting in his car, steam all over the place. Ordinary means of grace. Do you need some help? Yes, I can help you. Turn on the heater. Go 55. I'll get you water. And a man comes to church and shares that. That's the ordinary means of grace. Isn't that delightful? When someone goes to hospital and there's a doctor there who knows what's going on and says, hey, look, you don't have this. You've got that. And I'm going to suggest this and you go on home. 
by the grace of God, that doctor has the means of seeing what's going on and passes it on. Isn't God good? The ordinary means of grace. Expect God to be God. And lastly, witness. We're not only be soldiers and students, but witnesses. Take time to bring God's word to the ungodly. Elijah did. Oh yeah, he's bold. And there are occasions when we must be as gentle as a dove. And on occasions where we must come and let it be known what God is saying. I am thankful for some leaders who are acting in the role of Elijah. But know this, it's not condemnation, it's witness. <laughs> Elijah came to Ahab and boldly told him, I have not troubled Israel, but you have in your father's house because you've abandoned the commandments of the Lord and followed the Baals. And then he challenges him to gather the prophets of Baal on Mount, Car Mount Carmel. What a warning, what a challenge, what a witness. The church triumphant, the church godly, yes. And that needs to be speaking in the face of this culture to the glory of Christ and the benefit of many. Loving, yet strong and bold. In Matthew chapter 5, 13 through 14, note this. The words of Jesus, the Son of the living God. Matthew chapter 5. Note. Here is the word. <clears throat> Verse 13. You are the salt of the earth. But if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. You're the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. In other words, live in the manner of Christ. And when we do so, there will be fruit. There are some people who will flee to Christ. And there will be many who will say, you're the enemy. But we must not back off. We must bring the word of God. Elijah brought it directly to Ahab. And from that moment on in the text, when that was recorded by the Holy Spirit, it has been a refreshing fountain to the church. Bring the word of God wherever we go. Take the name of Jesus with us. So we are. We know who the real culprit is. It's Ahab. We know what Ahab is about. He represents statism. He represents a people who say, we don't want your gospel. You're the problem. You're the troublemaker. You believe in Jesus only. You believe in the Holy Trinity. You believe in things that are so strange and we want nothing to do with you. In fact, you're criminals. We know that under the Greco-Roman world, many people, Christian people, died because of their faith in Christ, and it goes on today. We know this, and we must be aware to pray for our brothers and sisters and prepare our souls. But we are the light of the world that brings the word to a dead, dead culture. Ahab's the problem. We can be the problem if we deny God and, and act boldly in the flesh and say ridiculous things to the world system. But for the most part, that's not the issue for the church. We must tell the truth gracefully, truthfully, and receive the beating that will most assuredly come. We are to be, by the Holy Spirit, soldiers, students, and witnesses, lifting up the name of Jesus and doing it wherever we go in the way that honors the Lord best, not in the flesh, but in the spirit Realizing that God is God, he uses miraculous means and ordinary means <coughs> to dispense his grace. Trust him. It's going to be a good time. It's a time for service. And lastly, if there is anyone here who, who is at this moment being troubled by the Holy Spirit, because your heart is not right with God. 
Know this, that unless one repents or turns away from a life of sin and puts one's trust in Jesus Christ who suffered, died, and rose again, there is no hope. And you will go after the world. Oh, there may be conservative thinking, but in the end you'll go after the world. And these words from Jesus in Matthew 7 will be yours. Depart from me, for I never knew you, you worker of lawlessness. One must trust wholeheartedly in Christ. Turn from a life of self and sin and trust in Jesus, and he will set you free. May this be so by the power of God this day. Pastor Joe, would you close us, my brother? Father, thank you for the privilege of hearing your word preached. Father, we pray this morning for our brothers and sisters who are uh, sitting under the thumb of the state, having been called the troublers, and are sitting in prisons, and are sitting hungry. Some are no doubt fearful. We ask for your grace. We ask for your kindness. We ask that you would vindicate their cause and their faith. And Father, prepare us as we see the day rapidly approaching when we, because we have followed Christ, because we bend the knee to the Lord Jesus Christ alone are increasingly viewed as troublers. So Father, dismiss us from this place with your blessing, the blessing that you have decreed should be uttered over your people. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance